Today we're going to be talking about optimizing your brain. And uh, this is something that um, the world is also quite interested in. Uh, I have been around the, uh, uh, in multiple places, uh, particularly we started out in America. seminars on how to improve your intelligence and your emotional intelligence, often we get a lot of um, successful parents bringing their teenage kids and sitting them there in the front row. Uh, many of the successful um, Americans uh, have been successful because they have um, gone to good educational institutions and put that education into practice and become uh, successful that way, but they realize their own kids um, don't necessarily have the same motivation and even the same intelligence that they do. Uh, you know, in reality, I think I mentioned it um, last night at the Korean church, uh, because of genetic entropy, our, um, our intelligence tends to get worse than our parents. Uh, it may seem at times that the kids are smarter than their parents, uh, but uh, that might be because they've got younger brains, uh, or maybe their parents haven't put into lifestyle things that could have enhanced them. But in reality, uh, uh, many uh, kids could do as well as their parents, if, and in fact even better if they would put these things into practice. And so uh, I'll start out with uh, a study um, that was uh, published and got some national publicity in America. According to results of a study that followed thousands of students throughout their college careers, the higher education system is effectively broken. This is the most uh, prestigious form of accreditation you can get in universities. And I know San Duke University has to be accredited uh, by certain bodies to be able to collect government funds for students and that sort of thing. And that's uh, I think is also done in many universities in America. But the results show that on these Ivy League schools, many students are leaving college with degrees, but little to no improvement in critical thinking or complex reasoning skills. Many graduates, yes, people who graduated had trouble sifting fact from fiction, addressing subjects objectively, reconciling and analyzing conflicting reports of a single event, and making decisions and arguments based on fact and logic without being affected by appeals to emotion or political spin. Now when we take a look at what they were measuring here, these are things that we would tend to ask from functional citizens whether they have a degree in art, history, biochemistry, or nothing at all. But yet they could not be performed by a large percentage of college graduates from prestigious universities. And in reality, if they hadn't gone to university and had just used their brain wisely in other ways, they probably would have gotten better at these things. Because their frontal lobe actually should improve. You know, from age 18 to 22, the frontal lobe is still growing. And so uh, you ought to just naturally do better at these things. But in reality, uh, many of them were not doing any better at all. And so Richard Aram. And others wrote this book, Academically Adrift, Limited Learning on College Campuses. And the regional accreditation system is trying to change some of the things that they're doing to see if they might be able to mandate some things to improve this. Uh, but in reality, um, although they might be making some strides in the right direction, um, there are some greater things that could be done to enhance our brains than what is being done at most colleges and universities. So what we're wanting to expand is our intelligence. And your, our, uh, your intelligence, my intelligence, is our capacity to learn, retain, and apply knowledge. Sounds pretty simple, uh, but it's involved. It's often measured by an IQ test. Do they give IQ tests over here in Korea? <laughs> Yeah, they give IQ tests. 
And uh, the IQ test is our most accurate way of measuring. It's not supposed to be measuring your knowledge. It's supposed to be measuring your capacity to learn, retain, and apply new knowledge. And uh, the test is, um, uh, you know, good tests are the most accurate way of determining this, but even the best tests have shown to be inaccurate about 20% of the time. They'll miss some people that are highly intelligent and rate them low, and then they'll rate some people much higher and their intelligence is near that high. And so it's not, you know, a, um, the best, you know, it's not an ideal measurement, but it's the best we have. Intelligence has been found to be related somewhat to academic performance. College graduates' first job after graduation has been found to be related to their IQ. And that's why these um, teenagers are being set down in presentations that I give throughout the country by their parents uh, because they're well aware that if they go to an Ivy League school and do well in that school, they're much more likely to have a six-figure income job right out of college. It turns out how far they advance in that job, once they get it, is no longer related to their IQ, however. It's related to their EQ. EQ is what will, emotional intelligence is what will give you advancements. And I've run across people who are highly intelligent, and they tell me the reason why they've been passed over for promotions is because their boss is not intelligent enough to recognize their intelligence. Uh, but, but in reality, that's not the reason why they've been passed by. They've been passed by because they don't have the emotional intelligence aspect of that. So what are advantages of having higher intelligence? You're more efficient in studying. Is that a benefit? Yes. Absolutely. You can live a more balanced life and still do well academically. You're more creative. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You're more logical. You're also more persuasive. And your influence also tends to go up. And if this is on your priority list, you're more likely to become wealthy. And uh, for some highly intelligent people, that's not even in their top 10 priority list. So you can still be a very poor person and be highly intelligent, uh, depending on where the priorities um, are at. There's another advantage, however. This was a large study, Harvard published it, 862 men and women, and notice they were followed from childhood starting in 1922 until 1986. The data was being accumulated but wasn't actually analyzed and published until 2005 by Harvard. And the researchers found that up to the cutoff point of 163, participants' risk of dying during a given period decreased as their IQ increase. For instance, those with a childhood IQ of 150 had a 44% lower risk of death than those with an IQ of 135. Now what's the average IQ? It's 100. So 135 is pretty highly intelligent. But if you even get higher intelligence and you go to 150, your risk of living a long time goes up incredibly. And so this is something that people have not really looked at as far as longevity statistics are concerned, but we really need to look at it because IQ is related to longevity. And of course, the question is asked, and Harvard didn't really answer it, but now we know a couple of reasons. Why is this the case? Why is it if you're highly intelligent, you have the capacity to learn, retain, and apply new knowledge that you're living longer? Well, intelligence involves multiple lobes of the brain. The temporal lobe of the brain is right there behind the ear, and that's where your memory is centered. Remember, intelligence is your capacity to learn, and what else? Retain, and so you have to have a temporal lobe. Uh, a well-functioning temporal lobe to have intelligence. The occipital lobe is not only where our vision is at, but where visual spatial orientation is. They always measure that in regards to intelligence. 
And uh, some people have more gifted occipital lobes uh, than others. I think my wife is one of those. Um, she can, um, you know, walk into a building. Um, in fact, this happened this morning. I'm just, uh, you know, we were on this hike up the mountain. And uh, as uh, it wasn't until on the way back down that I was actually talking to her and said, you know what? They actually have the ability here to run depression recovery programs. And I said, but I'm really disappointed about that center as far as the hydrotherapy potential. And she says, no. She says, we can, the, those five offices there, we can clean those out. We can do this, we can do that. She already had that in mind if we needed to uh, change this about. You know, we'd have to look at the plumbing and things, but that's what she can do. She can walk into a building and she can uh, see how things can be changed around and those type of things. And architects, when we have done this in, in the United States a lot, architects are amazed because she doesn't have an architectural training, but she makes their job so much easier uh, because she's got, she can get in there and get that perspective, and that's just a more gifted occipital lobe. Uh, parietal lobe uh, is uh, uh, where a lot of intelligence is centered. Einstein uh, gave his brain to science, and uh, we found out his parietal lobe was a little bit larger uh, than most other parietal lobes. Uh, he was using his brain, I think, uh, to greater capacity than a lot of others do. Parietal lobe is where calculation, division, subtraction is at. It's also where language comprehension occurs, as well as a more creative speech. Cerebellum is where our coordination is centered. And so when teams get on a field to compete, they're actually determining which team has the most corporately developed cerebellum. They don't recognize that's what they're doing. Uh, but that's precisely what they're doing. And uh, the frontal lobe is actually where emotional intelligence and general intelligence come together. It's also well known uh, to be the spiritual part of the brain, where spirituality and morality are centered. In fact, this is a quote from Guyton's textbook of physiology that's still used in medical school. Scientific studies show the frontal lobe is the seat of spirituality, morality, and also the will. So this is where our decision-making ability also comes from. Now, uh, animals have brains as well. And when I was in high school biology, I had to dissect the cat. The last thing we got into was the brain of the cat. And what I was amazed was only 3.5% of a cat brain is in the frontal lobe. Not much morality in a cat. <laughs> if you've seen it torture its victims to death and enjoy the process. Uh, you know, anyone who enjoys torture, it's a sign of serious frontal lobe compromise. You can't enjoy it unless your frontal lobe is seriously compromised. Uh, dogs have a little bit more frontal lobe, 7%. They're not the most moral creatures. They won't hesitate to murder if they have to. Uh, but if you notice, they do it much more mercifully. They don't enjoy torture. Uh, they also are able to empathize with other creatures, uh, more so even other human beings and other dogs because their frontal lobe has a larger capacity. Chimpanzees have the most of any other animal species. 17% of their brain is in the frontal lobe. But what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom is our frontal lobe size. 33, up to 38% of a human brain is in the frontal lobe. And this is what gives us the ability to accomplish advanced planning and thinking and to um, determine our own destiny. Now frontal lobes, uh, are compromised and can be compromised. And it's well known now what happens when a human being's frontal lobe starts to be compromised. There's an impairment of moral principle that will occur. If we want to follow the decline of morality in an individual or society, the answer is simply going to be where the frontal lobe of the brain uh, is, is at. 
And so morality goes down as the frontal lobe goes down. Social impairment will also go down. It's natural love. Your brothers, sisters, mother, father, when that natural love for family goes away, it's often due to a frontal lobe compromise. Lack of foresight occurs. Um, our ability to reason from cause to effect is a frontal lobe phenomenon. Our ability to see into the future and to see consequences is a frontal lobe phenomenon. In fact, you can actually follow your child's frontal lobe development for how far they are planning in the future. And you know, if you have just a real little kid and you tell them on Wednesday something's going to happen on Saturday, um, they'll be excited about it on Wednesday, but when Saturday comes around, they might have already forgotten about it and they don't have the frontal lobe capacity to really think that far in advance. But pretty soon they'll be able to think that far and they'll even know next year I'm going to be in the third grade, you know, they're looking ahead. And hopefully their frontal lobe develops to the point where they can recognize that what they're doing today can actually have eternal consequences and that they can uh, plan wisely for their marriage partner and their career and those types of things. Do you know how long it takes the frontal lobe to be fully developed in human beings? Structurally, it takes 30 years to complete its structural development. So the most of these students here at Sam Hughes University, they look like they've reached their adult size and weight, but there's still hope for them. Uh, they, uh, the frontal lobe is not uh, completed in its development. And of course, for all of us, uh, um, we can, even if we're over 30, we can enhance our frontal lobe, not structurally per se, but we can as far as neuroplasticity, as far as circulation and activity is concerned. Abstract reasoning is impaired. And uh, our ability to interpret proverbs goes down. Uh, as a result, our, our ability to think symbolically also goes down. I remember I was actually asked to speak at a large high school in Texas not long ago. They had me, uh, this was a public high school, and they had me speak there for career days. They wanted me to speak on the frontal lobe of the brain. And uh, I asked them a question, this group of students. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, in these big public high schools, um, they even have policemen roaming the aisles, you know, and things like that, you know, because you don't know if these kids are going to, how they're going to get out of control or what they're going to do. So, you know, there's uh, thousands of kids gathered in this auditorium, and I just asked them a simple question uh, to interpret this proverb to test their frontal lobe function. What does it mean that people that live in glass houses should not throw stones? And uh, the answer I got back, first answer was, if you do that, you're going to break your house. <laughs> now, uh, that's called concrete reasoning. It's not the interpretation of the proverb. And then someone else answered something differently, but along the same lines, the third person answered, still wasn't thinking in the abstract. Finally, one kid from the very back, he walked down slowly and came to the front says, if you don't want to be picked on, you better not pick on somebody else. Now, that's not the clearest interpretation of the proverb, but for a high schooler, it was pretty good. And so uh, uh, we said, yes, uh, that works. That's the interpretation. And uh, uh, he, the, the whole place broke out into applause for this boy who had a better frontal lobe than most of them. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, but then I asked him a question, how many of you think your parents would have been able to get that one right? The vast majority of them raised their hands. And I said, I think you're right. Your parents would have gotten that one right. And if you didn't know that, there's a whole lot of other things in life you have no clue about. And that's why you still need to depend on the wisdom of your parents um, for quite uh, some period of time. Uh, this abstract reasoning impairment is one of the reasons why people often need to be given the health message before they're given a study on the book of Revelation. You know, Revelation is a symbolic book, and they're not going to be able to digest it. You might tell them what the interpretation is, but the next study you can realize it's not quite there. You know, they, they don't really understand it. 
these are people that need the health message so their frontal lobes will work better and then they'll be able to click right along. Mathematical understanding is diminished. Uh, calculation, division, subtraction is parietal lobe, but higher forms of math, calculus, higher forms of algebra require the frontal lobe of the brain. Empathy goes down when the frontal lobe is down. And you know, we have a statement, I don't know if there's a statement like this in Korea. Uh, I'd be curious if there is, because I know shoes are a big thing here in Korea, or, or when not to wear shoes as well. Um, but uh, the, um, the, the statement in America is, unless you have walked in her shoes, there's no way you can understand how she's feeling. Do you have a statement like that in Korean? Unless you've walked in her shoes or in his shoes. What is that? Is that a true statement or a false statement? All right, how many say it's a false statement? Uh, there's, there's one hand that went up and he wasn't from Korea. Uh, <laughs> uh, how many say it's a true statement? It's actually um, both a true statement and a false statement. So we'll let both of you get the, that test question right. Uh, let me tell you how it's a true statement. It is a true statement for those who do not have a well-functioning frontal lobe. Studies have shown this. If your frontal lobe is well-functioning, you don't have to have been through what she went through. You can just hear about what she went through and you will feel precisely the same emotion. And so that's why you're able to have that compassion and sympathy when the frontal lobe is well functioning. But if your frontal lobe is not well functioning, there's no way you're going to be able to understand it unless you have experienced precisely the same thing. Lack of restraint uh, tends to occur when the frontal lobe goes down. Boasting, hostility, these type of things become more commonplace. Now when the frontal lobe is strengthened, creativity goes up. Sometimes it's called ingenuity. What is creativity? There are two essential components, originality and also adaptive, making a positive contribution to the life of others. This is one of the things in the engineering world that is often stated from one um, country or culture to another. Some are very good at copying what others have done. But to be able to be original and come up with something new and different and useful requires a different level of brain function. And some people pride themselves in being creative, but in reality, Although they might be different, it's, their difference is not producing any positive usefulness to anyone else's life. So in reality, those people are just bizarre, or they're strange, or you know whatever. And so uh, you know you can go to YouTube videos and look up creativity and see some of the most bizarre, strange stuff. That's not true creativity. Creativity means that what you are doing is not only original, but it is being useful to the lives of others. And this is why, uh, by the way, this is one of the reasons why IQ is related to wealth. Because if you come up with something that is completely original and useful to others, and you put that into practice, you can go from the lowest socioeconomic status, within a few years you can be at the top of the socioeconomic status because you have created something that's useful to others and people want to buy it. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, people like um, Steve Jobs, where now if you put the iPhone end to end, it will now circle the entire globe. Uh, you know, so he came up with something that was useful, original, but um, was um, adaptive um, to others. Interest also goes up when the frontal lobe goes up. And it's fun to interact with someone who is intrigued by everything. And the book Character, Strengths, and Virtues that talks about this mentions that curiosity can be cultivated, which of course it can be. 
No one need ever search for interesting experiences. One will what? Simply have them. Uh, you, one of the areas that is causing a lot of concern to me and other educators throughout the world is that kids these days are frequently bored. If you are, you know, if you don't have your personal device with you, and you think that's going to increase your boredom, it's a sign that there's some frontal lobe compromise there. Because in reality, this is what will happen when someone has an intact, well-functioning frontal lobe. They might be sentenced to this room. You know, after five o'clock, we're going to be through here. And uh, I might say, sorry, you're not leaving. You're staying here. And, uh, you know, that person might be disappointed that they're having to stay. And everybody else leaves. And at first, they're kind of feeling sorry for themselves and wondering why they've been singled out. But if they have an intact frontal lobe, they'll get over that pretty um, easily. And then they'll actually begin to study something in this room that will be highly interesting to them. And when they're interrupted from that study because it's time to go, it's almost like, well, wait a minute, I haven't finished studying this out yet. I'm pretty interested. And so uh, that is uh, something that will happen when you have a well intact frontal lobe. And we'll talk about why being easily distracted um, actually is connected with being frequently bored, which is connected with frontal lobe compromise. And fortunately, these are things that we can enhance. However, if you're in that category, don't despair. Uh, there are things that you can do to get out of that category and to actually improve uh, this area of your brain. And by the way, love of learning. Love of learning is connected to the frontal lobe as well. And so, um, that's something that um, uh, is obviously beneficial uh, to us. Well, how can we impair the frontal lobe? Well, drugs will impair it, uh, whether it's amphetamines or cocaine or marijuana or narcotics or all these recreational drugs. They have one thing in common. They suppress the frontal lobe of the brain. And even some prescription drugs can suppress it. One of the most commonly used prescription drugs in America that suppresses the frontal lobe are the benzodiazepines, lorazepam, clonazepam, and, and uh, you know, alprazolam, and um, you know, we call those Xanax and Ativan, Valium, uh, these type of things. Uh, they're frontal lobe suppressants. Um, you know, the pain medicines uh, that are commonly used, the oxycontins and the hydrocodones and those type of things actually suppress the frontal lobe of the brain. And uh, this is why uh, we really need to weigh the benefits versus the risks of utilizing these medicines, uh, particularly long term. Then there are legal drugs that impair. Alcohol actually adversely affects the frontal lobe of the brain before it affects any other portion of the brain. Now in Korea, is there a legal limit to being intoxicated and driving? their blood alcohol level limit. Does anyone know what that is? In America, in most states, it's 0.08%. Uh, and um, studies show if you're at that level, 0.08%. Let's say you're at 0.07%. So you're just, just barely legal. If a policeman pulls you over, would you be able to walk a straight line? You actually could. And if you were skilled at doing so, they say the most difficult feat to accomplish in all of sports, and you know, you have some players that play this sport, I've noticed, that come from this country. The most difficult feat in all of sports is to hit a curveball out of a baseball park. The ball is coming from 60 feet away, and it's coming at 90 miles an hour, and it's curving and dropping. And you have to put that thin ball on a thin bat and smack it out of the park. And there is a player who's not Korean, um, he's actually Latino in America, 
has gotten famous. In fact, he's worshipped by the other players because he can be under the influence of alcohol to about that level, and he'll still hit balls out of a baseball park while he's had alcohol. Why is it then that he's 10 times as likely to get into an automobile accident? And by the way, this player has gotten into several automobile accidents, driving under the influence of alcohol. He can hit a baseball out of a baseball park, but he's having auto accidents. Why? It doesn't have to do with his coordination. It has to do with his judgment. And what happens with these drivers is they don't recognize they're drunk because their coordination is fine. But this is what Princess Dye's driver had problems with. Princess Dye's driver was walking normally. He was conversing normally. Um, nobody recognized he was drunk, but he attempted to negotiate a turn in a tunnel at a speed that was impossible to negotiate. The best race car driver in the world would not have been able to successfully negotiate that turn at that speed. And thus, he lost his life, the princess lost her life, that wreck has been well analyzed. We were just in Paris a few weeks ago uh, and um, saw the place where this happened. And uh, that wreck has been well analyzed. The best race car driver in the world would not be able to successfully negotiate that turn at that speed. Now, the next day, if you have been under the influence and you've had nothing to drink, are you going to be able to drive successfully? Let me ask you this question. Does it take critical abstract thinking to drive an automobile successfully? How many say yes? How many say no? The answer is actually no. That's why we allow 16-year-olds to do it. Uh, <laughs> it does require judgment, but it doesn't require critical abstract thinking. Now, where it does require critical abstract thinking, here's what the studies are showing on alcohol. Do you know how long it takes critical abstract thinking to come back? Your judgment can come back in a day. But critical abstract thinking, it takes 30 days for the brain to fully come back after alcohol. Now, where does that play a role? It's not going to play a role in drug and automobile. But it will play a role if you are a pilot and you're flying in instrument conditions, and one of your instruments goes bad, and you've got to figure out which instruments are going bad and which instruments are not going bad. Do you know where that played an influence at? Air France, from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to Paris. It's exactly what happened. Those pilots were in instrument conditions, it was night, and one of their instruments went bad. Do you know how long they had to figure it out? Seven minutes. It was a problem that was solvable. It wasn't a problem that they had trained for, so they couldn't rely on their memory. It was a problem where they needed their frontal lobe to be able to solve it. And it was a solvable problem. And they, with two of them together, they continued to be in a tail stall all the way down to the ocean. And everybody lost their life. I have no doubt, as smart as those two were, that if they had not had any alcohol, by the way, they had had alcohol in the last week, but had they not had any alcohol for 30 days, those people would very likely be alive, because it was a solvable problem. Nicotine. It's a more subtle, but it does adversely affect the frontal lobe of the brain. And the most commonly consumed drug in America also has a role to play in the frontal lobe of the brain. And I would say this is also the most commonly consumed drug in Korea. Caffeine, Caffeine ends in I-N-E because it is a drug. And actually, it's an addictive drug. 
Caffeine blocks the adenosine receptors in the frontal lobe of the brain. Pavlov studied this out. Typists can type a little bit faster under the influence of caffeine, but they make 10 times as many errors. And also, there was a nice study showing that when you have caffeine on board, you're more likely to gossip than if you don't have caffeine on board. Now, in order to study something, you have to measure it. And so, what was their definition of gossip? It was sharing private information with someone who's not part of the problem or part of the solution to the problem. And so, if you're sharing private information with someone who's not part of the problem, part of the solution to the problem, the studies show you're twice as likely to do that when caffeine is on board. Uh, recently, there's a sport in America. We talked about the most difficult thing to do in sports. But what's the most popular sport in the United States of America? Football. It's actually football. And it's not football the way you guys probably call football, which is called soccer. Uh, it actually um, is a different game. Uh, but it turns out, even though it's the most popular sport in America, there's only one player that requires an intact frontal lobe to be able to do his job yeah. successfully on an NFL field. <laughs> it's the quarterback. That's the guy who makes the decision with the ball. There's a lot happening, and then he has to make the decision with the ball. And what the studies have shown is that the quarterback makes far better decisions when he's a caffeine-free quarterback. And so they're telling the quarterbacks, no caffeine. But yet they're telling the linemen to load up on caffeine to sack that quarterback. And uh, I've noticed, though, that uh, all the quarterback has to do is just make a little step sometimes, and those people that are loaded up on caffeine have no breaks. They just keep on going. <laughs> and uh, maybe the linemen will get a little bit, uh, or the linemen coaches will get a little bit smarter. But by the way, this does have a role to play, even in regards to head trauma. You know, that's the big enigma of the NFL, is post-traumatic brain syndrome. And it's a serious situation. We've had football players come through our program because this increases their risk of depression and anxiety significantly. It can cause all sorts of issues. And if you've suffered more than one concussion, um, this is really where it can play its toll. And there was a quarterback for um, the Dallas Cowboys. I lived next to Dallas for many years uh, with our practice, so um, I knew about this guy. He was 34 years old. He was one of the most accurate passers in, in the entire league, and he was being let go by the Cowboys. And when his, he knew he was still very capable. And so the NFL coaches were all getting together for a winter meeting and he set up 10 mannequins at the 50 yard line and he sat at the goal line and he had just 10 balls and he nailed every one of them right in their numbers, one right after another. And even after that, not one NFL coach would hire him. Why is that the case? Because his decision making with the ball had gone down considerably. Why had it gone down? Repeated concussions. And you know, interestingly, he's still a, a, a commentator, so if he has time, he can, you know, make good comments and things. But uh, the frontal lobe is indeed something quite important, even for the day-to-day -day activities uh, that occurs. Now, in regards to caffeine, Many people think it's necessary in their case. They might think, you know, it'd be better to be caffeine-free for most people, but for me, I'm just a zombie without it. I can't function without it. This study was done in the United Kingdom. Large study, 379 adults. It was placebo-controlled and a prospective study. Although frequent consumers feel alerted by caffeine, especially by their morning tea, coffee, or other caffeine-containing drink, Evidence indicates that this is actually merely the reversal of the fatiguing effects of acute caffeine withdrawal, <laughs> wrote Peter Rogers of Bristol's Department of Experimental Psychology. Measurements show that caffeine users' post-caffeine levels of alertness were actually no higher 
than the non-caffeine consumers who receive the placebo, suggesting caffeine only brings coffee drinkers back up to normal. In other words, all the reported benefits of caffeine are present virtually all day, only in those who don't consume it. So if you want to have the most energy and not have the peaks and the valleys, you'll actually be caffeine free and you'll have a better frontal lobe. This may not work because it was on a thumb drive, but Paul Laurenti from Wake Forest University I did a study where he showed cerebral blood flow went down considerably. And so one of the ABC announcers wanted to try it out. It's called a, a functional MRI. And I'm not going to be able to show it to you. But she drinks one cup of coffee, gets under this, and a dramatic decrease in circulation in the frontal lobe. Uh, and there's nothing that's giving you red flags when this is happening. In other words, there's no indicator or red lights going on. Watch out. Don't get into this conversation. You don't have a frontal lobe. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you feel like everything's normal, and then you end up sabotaging yourself and uh, having regrets and those types of things. And uh, it, is, um, it is pretty amazing. By the way, marijuana has now become a major issue in the country. Multiple states are legalizing it and making recreational use okay. And a massive four-decade study published in 2012 by the National Academy of Sciences titled Persistent Cannabis Users Show Neuropsychological Decline from Childhood to Midlife. Followed more than a thousand subjects from birth until age 38, the researchers' core finding repeated marijuana use lowers IQ And it also lowers motivation and emotional intelligence. In fact, the lowest levels of motivation you will find in marijuana users, their only motivation will be try to figure out where they're going to get their next marijuana from. But other than that, there's not much motivation going on in these people. And uh, this, of course, is going to, um, you know, we've had business people that have business interests in marijuana. They all want it to get legalized, and they're giving reasons like if it gets legal, then you can tax it, and we can raise more revenue, and maybe pay for the deficit this way, and those type of things. But they're going to massively destroy the deficit even further because gross national product's going to go down. These marijuana users are on assembly lines. They're going to get fired. <laughs> and they're going to be on unemployment. And they're going to be harder to find workers. And so it is going to actually have a detrimental effect on the bottom line, even in regards to taxes. Well, what is the frontal lobe desire for optimal function? Carbohydrates are used almost exclusively by the brain for optimal function. Where are natural carbohydrates found? Fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables. They impart a strength, a power of endurance, a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet, a classic quote from that classic book, Ministry of Healing. Now, sugar is also a carbohydrate. Shouldn't it be good for the brain? Actually, studies are clear. Large amounts of sugar in the diet impair frontal lobe function in school-age children and also in adults. Why is that the case? What happens when you eat a candy bar to your blood sugar? It skyrockets, and your pancreas thinks you've had a large amount of fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables. And so it starts cranking out an abundance of insulin. And before you know it, about 20 minutes, your blood sugar is down lower than it was before you ate the sugary substance. It overshoots it, and once you have hypoglycemia there, it takes four hours for the frontal lobe to fully recover. So if you're taking a test that just involves memory, you're going to do all right, but if you're having to problem solve, it's going to have an adverse effect. It makes about a grade letter difference in performance. This was a very nice study because it was large. 4,000 kids, three, four, seven, and eight and a half year olds controlled for known factors that affect IQ. 20% of the highest processed diet had a five point lower IQ compared with 20% who ate more health conscious diet with more fruits, vegetables, salads, pasta, rice. Five points is quite a bit. That's a half of a standard deviation. And if you look at the top 1%, it's a lot more than five points that they benefit. So you have a lot more of the antioxidants, no arachidonic acid, that can help as well. Arachidonic acid is a pro-inflammatory molecule. It's now been studied in a lot of different settings. If you're on an arachidonic acid-free diet, 
your emotional intelligence will go up in, within two weeks. That's your ability to manage your emotions. Um, anxiety gets better. Depression gets better to some extent. Arachidonic acid decreases the synthesis and storage of acetylcholine, but it also produces pro-inflammatory response. Where is arachidonic acid found in the diet? It's found in meat, fish, and eggs. It's not present in dairy or in plant foods. And so uh, this is one of the reasons for the plant-based advantage on intelligence. But this study looked at it from the other perspective. This was the British Medical Journal, a prestigious medical journal. And it looked at children and looked at their IQs. And it found out children at age 10, when their IQs were measured and they were high, they were more likely to become vegetarians by age 30. A study of more than 8,000 men and women age 30 whose IQs were measured and they were 10 showed that the higher the IQ, the greater the odds of becoming a vegetarian. For each 15-point rise in IQ scores in the study, the likelihood of being a vegetarian rose by 38%. This was even after adjusting to factors such as social class and education. The link was still consistent. Now, if you take a look at the, the discussion of this, the British Medical Journal asked the question, why? Why is this happening? And when, it, when they discussed it, it got back to the definition of intelligence. Do you remember what the definition of intelligence is? Your capacity to do what? Learn, retain, and apply knowledge. And they basically said if you have a high IQ, you're more likely to learn that this is a superior way of eating. You're more likely to retain this is a superior way of eating. And you're more likely to do what? Apply it in your life. Now, uh, this is um, this study has given uh, me another reason. I'm often asked to speak in a lot of uh, places um, regarding optimizing your brain or depression and anxiety, but people don't realize that I'm uh, also a plant-based vegetarian. In fact, I was even asked today at the meal time, "So, are you vegetarian?" Or, you know, they didn't, um, know if that would be the case or not. And um, they'll often at the um, meal time figure it out because I'm eating with all of these other psychologists and, and other individuals and they'll notice I'm ordering things differently. Uh, and then they'll ask the question, so um, are you vegetarian, Dr. Nedley? And after I answer yes, what do you think their next question is? Why are you a vegetarian? Why are you a vegetarian? <laughs> is the question. And uh, now I can just give them a t simple two-word answer. High IQ. <laughs> actually, I've been tempted to say that, but I've never said it. <laughs> it would actually indicate I have a low EQ. <laughs> uh, but uh, omega-3 fats and neurodegenerative diseases. This is something that's also important. Omega-3 fats appear to help prevent neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. These devastating illnesses are associated with decreased brain blood flow. Animal models suggest that compromised brain circulation contributes to the genesis of dementia. It is not merely the result of brain deterioration. And omega-3 fats are particularly helpful in improving brain circulation and preventing blood vessel changes. There are hippocampal benefits of omega-3. That has to do with the memory. Among omega-3-induced hippocampal effects is a tenfold rise in the production of transthyretin. TTR appears to be vital to long-term brain health by scavenging or rounding up something called amyloid beta protein, the compound that accumulates and tangles in Alzheimer's brains. By gathering up these abnormal proteins, TTR is believed to prevent the damaging amyloid tangles or aggregates, thus potentially staving off dementia. Well, most people get their omega-3 out uh, fish through fish. And uh, if you weren't at the presentation the other day on nutrition in the brain, um, uh, you, uh, you know, we uh, basically revealed fish was a great way to be getting your omega-3 100 years ago. Not anymore, because it's the most toxic-laden food in our food supply. And there is no such thing now as a mercury-free fish. Um, it's there in, in every fish. And uh, in fact, 
you can easily track your own mercury levels. It's linearly related to how much fish you're eating. Uh, and so omega-3, if we still need it, uh, but we need to be getting it from sources that are not toxic laden because toxins do have their adverse effects. In fact, if you would look at the effects of mercury, they're all the opposite of the effects of omega-3. Decreased memory, decreased concentration, increase in anxiety, increase in depression, all of these sorts of things. And uh, I did reveal the other day at the faculty meeting uh, the study that we have done on um, 6,000, well, 5,600 individuals, there was at that time, uh, the fish consumption, their emotional intelligence um, lowering with the more fish consumed, as well as depression and anxiety scores being higher. And so we need to be looking at mercury-free fish choices. By the way, there is a drug, and since omega-3 is so powerful in helping the brain, and other things as well, drug companies, if they were able to patent this, they could make a fortune. And of course, they can't patent it. They try to, and the nice letter comes back from the patent office saying, prior art. You know, in other words, it's been there in nature, you can't patent it. But one company found out a way they could patent it. They patented a mercury removal process from fish. And it's a three-step process. It's the most sophisticated process. And it's a drug that costs you almost $300 a month. Uh, and it's called Lovesa. And uh, when that drug was marketed to me by the pharmaceutical rep, I asked her, a qu what question do you think I asked her? How is, is all the mercury out of there? Well, you know, it's the best process ever described in removing mercury. Okay, I understand that. How much mercury is left? Well, I'll need to actually write a letter to the scientists and, and see what they say about that. Do you want me to write a letter? Yeah, absolutely, I do. So next time she comes back, well, where's that letter? Well, here it is, I've got it for you and, and I'll show it to you. And the letter basically said, there is no way that we can get mercury out of the fish completely. Uh, and so these little supplements you see called mercury-free fish oil, don't believe it. It's not true. Uh, they can get about 90, a little over 90 percent, so they're doing a pretty good job. But it turns out if you would get the omega-3 the way the fish get it, by the way, the fish don't have any ability to make omega-3. Where are they getting it from? The plants of the water. That's right. If you get it from the plants of the waters, there's a thousand to a million fold less mercury in those plants. And so you're doing far better than Lovesa. And it's actually far cheaper. You don't have to pay the 200 to $300 a month. Uh, and so uh, we actually recommend, uh, if you want to get precisely that same EPA DHA, um, that you actually get it from the plants of the waters. But you can also get it from land plants as well, particularly when you convert it. These are the land plants that are high in omega-3, almonds, spinach, green soybeans. Mature soybeans are not good sources of omega-3. They have higher omega-6. Uh, soybean oil, wheat germ oil. If you're eating white bread, you're not getting your omega-3. In fact, the studies on white bread show that you'd be better off to not eat at all than to eat white bread. But um, whole wheat bread is healthy. And it actually continues to show to be healthy in, uh, unless you're gluten sensitive, which 96% of the population are not gluten sensitive. Um, it actually is um, quite healthy um, for the brain. Black walnuts are healthy, English walnuts. Chia seeds are near the top. And notice black seed up there at the very top. There's much more omega-3 in flax and chia than you'll find in any fish anywhere. Folate is also a nutrient that's very important to methylate three molecules. 5-hydroxytryptophan, which makes serotonin, and um, dopamine, as well as norepinephrine. And norepinephrine is very important in cognitive function, your ability to concentrate. 
And uh, many people are undersupplied. Our U.S. government says many people are not getting their 400 micrograms of folate. But we actually recommend 1,000 micrograms in order to have adequate methylation. You can know if you're, doing, if you're a doctor and you have access to a laboratory, a homocysteine level less than 8 means that you're methylating appropriately. If it's higher than 8, you're not methylating as well. And uh, one of the ways in which you can increase methylation is, is folate. And you can see by eating steak, 16 micrograms of steak, that's a double serving. Um, you'd have to eat so much steak that you'd die that very day to get anywhere close to a thousand micrograms. Uh, parsnips, 44 micrograms. Uh, pineapple juice, 58. Orange juice, 75. Peanuts are a good source, 88 micrograms in just a quarter cup. Mustard greens, your greens are going to be pretty high, 105. Spinach, 109. Navy beans, 255. So your legumes are higher. And notice this, okra, 269 micrograms. And the two highest sources, lentils, 831 micrograms. And the highest, lack high tea, 1,057 micrograms of folate. So diet can have a significant influence in regards to your mental abilities and can have a nice measurable effect. Physical exercise also is important. Getting that circulation going and becoming more fit is very important. But there's something else that is often overlooked. By the way, someone were asking how much we use exercise in our program. In our 10-day program, exercise is key. That's one of the reasons why it started to trigger to me that we could have a program here at Sam U when I was going up that hill and recognized there's a lot of nice miles. You know, Weimar has 15, um, uh, over 15 miles of trails, uh, mountain trails, and so we have lots of capability for exercise. And we're exercising some of these people at a minimum of an hour a day, but for some of them they're getting three hours of aerobic exercise a day. We're jump starting it. They don't need to stay on three hours once they go home, but to jump start it. Studies show the more exercise, the better. And so um, uh, being able to walk up to the top of that mountain and get fit and measure yourself and being able to get up there quicker, those types of things, that's going to lead to some improved cognitive function, improved emotional um, aspects as well. But there's another type of exercise that's often overlooked. Dr. Eric Sigmund talks about it. Working with one's own hands in a real-world, three-dimensional environment is imperative for full cognitive and intellectual development. And he's concerned. Well, we don't, I didn't have the, the rest of it, but um, the, the concern of his report is that two-dimensional learning is greatly increasing and three-dimensional learning is becoming a thing of the past. And it's adversely affecting people's ability to learn. Um, what's two-dimensional learning? You know, this would be, you know, all the, the computer stuff, um, writing, those type of things. Uh, three-dimensional learning um, is um, where you're working with your hands in three dimensions. And studies show even if you're washing the dishes repetitively for 20 minutes a day, it's improving your frontal lobe circulation. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, another thing that helps with this, in fact, we have this in our program, uh, to work with their hands in 3D in gardening. Contact with naturally occurring species of soil bacteria, mycobacterium vacae, causes the body to release vital immune chemicals called cytokines. These, in turn, spur the brain to produce the neurotransmitter serotonin. We know that some of these cytokines can activate the nerves and that relay signals from the body to the brain, researcher Chris Lowry said. Bristol University researcher said these studies help us understand how the body communicates with the brain, why a healthy immune system is important for maintaining mental health, they also leave us wondering if we shouldn't be spending more time doing what? Play. Playing in the dirt, uh, which actually has a number of healthy things that are associated with it, including working with your hands. 
I know even in the surgery realm, um, surgeons will recognize the benefit that their brain gets by working with their hands in 3D, even doing surgery. And it's one of the reasons why they like to be there at 7.30 in the morning, uh, working with their hands in 3D. There's something very positive that occurs um, to them, hopefully positive for the patient as well. Um, but it is uh, uh, something that is beneficial. One of the reasons why I haven't given up some of my procedural aspects of things in gastroenterology uh, and those type of things that require working with your hands in 3D. This may, it's speaking of gardening, this uh, effect may explain in part why people who are not exposed to the dirt in childhood have higher rates of allergies, asthma, and even mental health issues as adults. Now one thing I didn't see here, and I, I haven't seen all of Sam Uke, I haven't been given a comprehensive tour, but I am told that you have a farm here of some sort, is that true? Yes. Of some sort. Of yes. some sort. <laughs> Is this a farm where we could actually, you know, up at Weimar we have organic farms, they're beautiful farms there, but we have the patients actually come during, it's called farm fun, where they get out there and there we have the gardener go over things and they're actually, you know, harvesting sweet potatoes and, or uh, planting or weeding or things like that. And at first they wonder what in the world, you know, I've paid thousands of dollars to come to this program, they're having me out in their farm working. <laughs> Uh, but it is enjoyable um, for them. Even the ones that think they're going to hate it, you know, they're out, out there talking about it. They had a good time with it, and uh, uh, it is uh, something healthy. So, uh, you know, if you have at least some sort of farm over here, that's a that's a good. Every thing. freshman has to take it. Oh, every freshman has to work with their hands in the yes. dirt yes. here. All right, that's good. I like that policy. The simple act of picking fruit or vegetables, whether from a garden or in the wild, causes the brain to release the pleasure chemical dopamine, which activates the brain's reward centers. So not only does the planting help in the working with the dirt, but also harvesting. I've often remarked on the great joy I feel when I forage in the garden, especially when I discover and harvest the first of the season, the first luscious strawberry to ripen, or emergence of the first tender asparagus shoot comment writer Robin Francis. I've also wondered why I had a degree of inherent immunity to the retail therapy urges that afflicts all my friends and acquaintances. <laughs> Maybe as a long-term gardener, I've been getting a constant base load dopamine high, which has reduced the need to seek other ways to appease this instinct. And you know, these retail therapy urges, you know, it's not just shopping things. These retail therapy urges can be video games. It can be this or that or whatever. But we've noticed people that come through our program. By the way, it's a 10-day program where they're with us, but we talk about it being a 20-week program in their home setting. We follow up with them. But after they're about halfway through the 20 weeks, they'll mention, you know what? I used to have this urge to go play a video game or to do this or that. Those urges are gone. I don't even miss it. Uh, you know, I don't have to be on YouTube anymore. I don't have to be getting the latest hit in regards to music and those type of things. They recognize they're getting a constant base load dopamine high, which reduces the need to seek other ways to appease this instinct. Well, we have a, a few minutes left, but I want to make sure we're getting our circulation in. So let's stand up to uh, wake up here. And uh, get ready for the, for the second half. For the second half. Let's uh, reach up to the ceiling. Let's try some deep, deep in. I'll ask these health students if you heard what the best exercise is for building bone mineral density. Walking is a pretty good exercise. It's not the best though. Jogging is pretty good too. The actual, no, swimming is probably the worst. Not the worst. Uh, swimming is not a, gra it's a gravity exercise. Uh, weight bearing exercises, yeah. Uh, the actual best is jumping. Uh, 
So we're going to do 10 jumping jacks here. Put people in front of their favorite television program and hook them up to an electroencephalogram. 
90 seconds to at most three minutes, they're no longer in beta wave activity. If you're not in beta wave activity, your frontal lobe is not active. They're in an alpha wave rhythm. So they're recording information, they're recording duties, their emotions can laugh or cry with the scene, but they're no longer critically analyzing the information. And it has 17 detrimental effects on the frontal lobe of the brain. There have been over 3,000 studies done on the effect of entertainment television. Over 300 books have been written on the subject. It increases daydreaming. By the way, that's one of the risk factors for developing Alzheimer's dementia stage. You know. Daydreaming. What is daydreaming? Daydreaming is when you're in a line at a grocery store in a traffic jam and your mind goes into fantasy world. And instead of going into fantasy world, if you're doing something productive, even trying to memorize, you know, if you take out a three by five card and try to memorize, that actually is a good thing. But when daydreaming goes up, creativity always goes down. So creative ingenuity goes down, decreased interest in reading, decreased interest in learning, notice these frontal lobe effects, it reduces discernment, it trains you in non-reaction when you should be reacting, it increases aggressiveness, actually doubles aggressive impulses, reduces sensitivity to violence, and it's also addictive. In fact, any frontal lobe suppressant is going to end up being addictive, and this is a frontal lobe suppressant. The more TV adolescents watch, the more likely they are to develop attention and learning problems and do poorly in school in the long run. The amount of TV kids watched when they were 14 was positively linked with having attention problems later, not doing homework, being bored at school, not finishing high school, and even what? Hating school, the researchers found. 14-year-olds who added one more daily hour of TV doubled their risk of academic failure at age 16. That's significant. One hour of TV doubling your risk of academic failure. We could go on, but it takes away precious time as well for family and achievement and spiritual pursuits. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I would be, in fact, I can, I can tell you I'm sure I would never have developed the things that we've developed had I not been, had been raised by a wise father who raised me without entertainment television. I thought it was actually not a good thing at first in my life because all these other kids would be talking at school about what they saw on TV and things like that. But as I began to study the effects of this stuff, I realized, wow, what a blessing. I wouldn't have been wise enough to avoid it myself, probably. But what a difference it made. And by the way, that's also been true with others as well. I don't know if you have heard of the individual running for president called Ben Carson. He grew up 20 miles away from where I grew up. And he was hating school. He was failing. And his mother, who refused to get on welfare and had three jobs to feed her two kids, she was a single mom. One of her jobs was cleaning houses for the wealthy. And she noticed something in those wealthy homes. The TV was off. And the kids were reading interesting books. Just making that connection, she went home. And she said, things are changing in this house. No more TV, no more privileges until you check two interesting books out of the Detroit Public Library and write a book report for me on those two books every week. What do you think their feelings were for their mother at that point? Did it get better or get worse? They complained bitterly. And they said, no other parents doing this. You know, this is crazy, what's gone wrong with you? You know, all of these types of things, but they recognized she was serious. That TV was gone. And, but when, and they had to not just read fictional books, these had to be learning types of books that were useful. In fact, one of the reasons I think he's running for president is that back when, in those days, he would actually check books out, like on Abraham Lincoln, and those type of things, and learn about what was essential for what helped build this country, or 
the old America and those type of things. But he noticed something. Not right away. But he noticed a year later that his hatred for school and also he had this tremendous hatred for poverty. It was gone. But yet he didn't have another dollar to his name that he did a year earlier. And he was asked recently, why did your hatred for poverty go away when you were still dirt poor? His answer, I recognized my poverty was temporary. Because his grades had gone from the bottom of the class to the very top of the class. And you know, I've told students, many students, through the years that want to excel, that have not been able to excel, stop watching entertainment television, give it a year, and see what happens. That brain, its creativity, its abilities, those type of things start to go up significantly. The other thing he did around that time that changed, I'll talk about in a little bit, but this is something that I also took advantage of. By the way, what's the difference between entertainment television and educational television? But it's not just content. You can tell within one minute whether it's educational or entertainment. It's the scene of reference change. Exactly right. And uh, the scene of reference change, you know, I don't know, um, you may not have this in Korea, but in America we have something called C-SPAN. C-SPAN, you'll have a speaker up there talking, and you have no scene of reference change. It's just one camera view, and it's uh, and you know I've noticed something in the doctor's lounge where I used to practice in the hospital. Um, often the TV was on, but in doctor's lounges it's usually the news or very often it was C-SPAN. But you'd notice something. Doctors would be sitting there talking over the television and they'd be doing things like this, and and um, and then all of a sudden the uh, conversation would stop as the doctor would point at the TV set and said, did you notice what this senator said? He's got all these flip charts and he's doing all this and he mentioned this, 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 and this, but he totally neglected this, 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 and that. You will never see anyone argue with a set like that watching entertainment television. You don't have the capability. Your frontal lobe is down. But because of that one camera scene, one uh, not scene of reference, your frontal lobe can be fully engaged in front of the TV, and you're also not constantly staring at it. It's unnatural to stare at something that isn't flickering. Uh, and so your eyes are diverting around, and you're not getting into that hypnotic trance. And so uh, it's not all television that's bad. It's that rapid scene of reference. This was an interesting study done by Australia. Compared with adults who watch less than two hours of TV a day, those who watch more than four hours had a 46% higher risk of death from all causes and an 80% higher risk of cardiovascular death, death during a six-year study period. Each hour spent in front of TV per day raised a person's risk of death from cardiovascular disease by 18% and the risk of cancer by how much? 9%. Even cancer is significantly increasing. Reading or doing homework doesn't seem to be associated with risk factors. So it wasn't the sitting. People thought, well, maybe it's the sitting. They say it's not the sedentary behavior itself. It's something inherent about or associated with television viewing. And that really is the frontal lobe suppressing the fact. So there's two things as far as IQ and longevity. Number one is if you have high IQ, you're more likely to put into practice health principles are going to help you. And number two is, if your frontal lobe is fully intact and you're not suppressing it, you're going to live longer because there's actually positive immune system effects that occur with that. So even cancer is reduced um, as a result. Alvin Toffler, he's a media expert in America, he says constant stimulation of the senses shuts down the what? analytical processes and ultimately shuts down the ability to face life rationally. 
And you know, our kids today are constantly stimulating themselves with all sorts of things, but where does it lead to? It leads to not having the ability to face life rationally, and it leads to escape techniques that involve withdrawal, apathy, and rejection of what kind of thinking? Discipline, Discipline thinking when faced with difficult duties and decisions. When you're faced with difficult duties and decisions, that's the time when you need the most disciplined thinking. But instead, you're going to reject disciplined thinking when faced with difficult duties and decisions. And what starts this process off? Constant stimulation of the senses. I can tell you that movie producers are aware of this. Because the top movie producers in the world refuse to watch entertainment television. They won't watch someone else's movie. They would do it for 90 seconds to three minutes before the alpha waves come in to analyze what they've done and effects, but they've noticed their own creativity is going to go way down. And so to be the most creative in utilizing the media, interestingly, they won't utilize it themselves. Well, what about these devices we all have now? Digital classroom tools like computers, tablets, and smartphones offer exciting opportunities to deepen learning through creativity, collaboration, and connection. But those very devices can also be what? Distracting. Distracting the students. Similarly, parents complain that when students are required to complete homework online, it's a challenge for students to remain on task. You go into their room, they say they're doing their homework, and they're not doing their homework. That was their intention. <laughs> but they got distracted. If students don't learn how to concentrate and shut out distractions, research shows they'll have a much harder time succeeding in almost every area of life. The real message is because attention is under siege more than it has ever been in human history. We have more distractions than ever before. We have to be more focused on cultivating the skills of attention, says Daniel Gold. If young students don't build up the neural circuitry that focused attention requires, they could have problems controlling their what? Emotions. Emotions and being what? Empathetic. Empathetic. Why is that the case? The circuitry for paying attention is identical to the circuits for managing distressing emotions. This is why concentration and focus and being able to shut out distractions is crucially important because it's the identical circuitry for managing distressing emotions. This is why EQ and IQ come together there in the frontal lobe. The attentional circuitry needs to have the experience of sustained episodes of concentration, reading the text, understanding and listening to what the teacher is saying in order to build the mental models that create someone who is well educated. One of the keys to success is a digital Sabbath every day, sometime when kids aren't being distracted by devices at all and they're engaged in focused learning. This comes from Daniel Goleman. He's written a good book called Focus, the Hidden Driver of what? Excellence. Excellence. And this digital Sabbath is important. It should be a long digital Sabbath. In other words, not just 30 minutes, not just an hour. There should be prolonged periods of time when you aren't having a device that's distracting you. You know, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was at Vail, Colorado. We've actually run these Optimize Your Brain Centers in vacation resorts. Uh, some of these wealthy vacation resorts, um, they're very interested in optimizing your brain. I've noticed that people that have a good brain, they're interested in having a great brain. And you might look around and wonder, where are my friends that are having so many problems with their brain? They should be here at this seminar. Well, in reality, it's a sign that you do have a good brain, the fact that you're here. Hopefully, it's, well, I, maybe some of your health students, you were forced into coming here today. I don't know. <laughs> maybe your brain isn't as good as, as it would have been had you been here voluntarily. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, in uh, Vail, Colorado, um, there's a lot of uh, millionaires that come there every year for ski season. And so in the middle of ski season, right before the holiday time, we would put on an Optimize Your Brain seminar. And we would actually, um, our family loves to ski, but it's nice to do vacation work and mission work at the same time. And so while we were going up, we would go single file, and we'd come up with a brochure for Optimize Your Brain, and when you're on a, when you're on a chairlift, 
Uh, nobody can get off that chairlift for about a minute and a half to three minutes, and so you can talk to them about the seminar that's coming up. And amazingly, we'd have a lot of people show up at this seminar during their ski vacation resort, and these millionaires bringing their kids and sitting them down there. But one of the women mentioned after this section, she was a millionaire and had this big multi-millionaire home there. And her kids and grandkids would come every year for Christmas time for ski season. And this time, uh, you know, she had had kind of a bad experience the year before, and she was smart enough to notice the connection. So when they came in the door to stay for a week for ski season, she had a bucket, and she said, your device is going in here. And those kids said, wait a minute, Grandma, you know, I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. She said, well, you can go home then and do all that stuff. <laughs> you want to stay here? Your device goes in here. So they all complained, but they put their device in because she was serious and she was in charge of that home. And she said they had the best ski resort vacation ever. The kids were engaged, they were communicating, they were having a good time, even their games were much more enjoyable and engaging. And uh, what a difference it made. <coughs> I'll just tell you a hint. We were talking about putting on depression and anxiety recovery programs. Maybe I shouldn't let you know this. But when they come to our 10-day program, that device goes in a bucket. <laughs> they don't have iPads. They don't have laptops. This is a mental health boot camp, and they need to develop the focused attention. And, you know, we'll get complaints too, but at the end, they're thanking us for taking those devices away. In fact, we can't go device-free because we're communicating with each other as staff because of who's doing this and that. You know, I was telling someone today to take care of the seriously mentally ill. You have to get, have experience and have training. Those people are highly manipulative. Uh, they can have all sorts of issues uh, going on, and it's kind of like, you know, um, learning how to train a horse. This is why we'd have to have people that are here, you know, learn how to uh, train in all of this. And so we have to try to keep up with them and communicate uh, from one counselor to the other physician and those type of things. But uh, it is, it does make a powerful difference. And in fact, another thing I should mention about devices, this was just a recent study, I don't have it here in a transparency, but there is something that is 88% accurate for diagnosing depression or anxiety today without ever asking a person a single question. What is 88% accurate? How long you're on your personal device every day. And studies show the average depressed and anxious person is on that device an hour and six minutes. And the average person who's not depressed is on their device 17 minutes, a vastly different time span. Uh, and uh, so it is associated. Behavior itself can be associated with it, as well as um, uh, being a screening test uh, for it. So it's not completely accurate. There's obviously going to be exceptions there. Um, but it is a fairly accurate tool. And studies also show the more that you're utilizing screen time, the less what? Sleep. The less sleep. And sleep is also important. Our circadian rhythm is crucially important. And the best circadian rhythm for mental health, as well as academic performance, is early to bed early to rise. Your melatonin levels will have a nice peak when you go to bed at 9 o'clock. And if you go to bed at midnight, the amount of melatonin you'll make is going to be about half of what you make if it's 9 o'clock. I told the story last night in the Korean church how I changed my bedtime my second year of college where I was taking 16 credits of intense science is physics for scientists and engineers and organic chemistry, biology, quantitative analysis. I was in class all morning and labs all afternoon. And what a difference this made when I went early to bed, early to rise. I only had a couple hours of study in the morning. I would get up at four in the morning, sometimes three in the morning. Uh, but yet that study time was highly efficient and highly engaging. And, um, uh, got
got a 4.0 that semester and, and then it never changed after that. And so in medical school I was always um, going to bed early even though my friends thought I didn't know the material well. I really didn't know the material much better than they did, but when it came time for test time, because of this melatonin, the ability to learn, retain, and apply knowledge, um, a significant advantage uh, was there. So that's something uh, also to keep in mind. Music also has a role to play. Music enters the brain through its emotional regions, which include the temporal lobe and limbic system. This, uh, from there, uh, the, the uh, music can positively produce a frontal lobe response that influences the will, moral worth, and reasoning power. The type of music that tends to do this is actually traditional classical music that has melodies and harmonies. This is actually a um, picture I took myself uh, at the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. We would take our whole group down there for the Christmas concert. And uh, this is very frontal lobe enhancing exercise. In fact, this type of music is enjoyed by everybody. I know I hired a receptionist one time and she said, I'd like to go, but my husband is into heavy metal big time and he's not gonna enjoy it. I said, it's up to you, he doesn't have to go. And you don't have to go either, but I'm gonna predict something that he's gonna actually enjoy it. And he went and he did enjoy it. He was talking about the favorite pieces. You know, it's true that he might have chosen a heavy metal concert over that one if they were running side by side. Uh, but the heavy metal concert is going to suppress the frontal lobe of the brain significantly. And so um, there are seven characteristics. In fact, this, uh, this was an interesting study of six year olds took music lessons for one year, gained more points on IQ tests compared with their peers not involved in music classes. The benefit was small, but was seen across the spectrum of abilities measured in the tests, including math, language, and spatial skills. Every six-year-old that starts taking music lessons, what type of music are they learning? They all start out with a classical venue. Even your heavy metalist and rock music people, they all started out with classical music and learning that. And that's the, uh, a significant uh, advantage for the six-year-olds. Other kinds of music will evoke very little of any frontal lobe response will produce a large emotional response with very little logical or moral interpretation. And this is characterized by the syncopated rock and roll rhythms that are prevalent in popular music today, showing that upbeat music is not necessarily uplifting music. And, uh, and in fact, upbeat music can have its addictive components as well. You'll see the alpha wave rhythms come in after 90 seconds of three minutes. It's not just the syncopated rhythm one measure or two, it's the constant syncopation. And of course, that's the whole reason why you have a trap drum set. The whole idea of a trap drum set is to produce that syncopation, that boom cha, boom cha, boom cha, the repetitively over um, the course of the entire piece pretty much um, suppressing the frontal lobe of the brain. Music psychotherapy in which people are encouraged to reflect on their past, present, and future while listening to classical music improves mood and reduces stress. This is the University of Florida. These people had never been seriously exposed to classical music. They would have never chosen it. But six sessions of classical music therapy were held over a 12-week period in 23 to 45-year-olds. These subjects showed improved scores on test of overall mood reported feeling less depressed and reported feeling less fatigued. And also their cortisol levels improved significantly. So the characteristics of brains optimizing music, melodious music can be simple yet attractive. That's why not all classical music qualifies as being helpful. Some of the classical music is not melodious at all. And uh, it's actually been shown not to be healthy. Beautiful non-dissonance harmonies. Um, the harmonies that center in on the dissonance, which is what you're going to get more in your jazz, your sevenths, ninths, elevenths, thirteenths, those type of things. Musicians love them because they're different. You know, they get bored with the usual harmonies, but they're actually not healthy. The blue note actually is called a blue note for a reason. It causes the blues. Uh, and it's between that second and third beat, it actually induces depression, well, in the, uh, uh, well studied to do that. So it's okay to have those sevenths, ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths when you're transitioning, maybe. Uh, so, but when you center in on it, chord after chord after chord, it's an issue. Straight 
or march rhythms are healthy. And so if the music wants, makes you want to stand up and march around the room, that's a good thing. If it makes you want to stand up and swing the hips, not so good. Uh, <laughs> rhythm less prominent than the melody and harmony. Uh, and so um, rhythm is important, but it should be less prominent than the melody and harmony. And if the music tells a story where you can imagine a scene and it fits that scene, it's crucially important. And if there's also an additional enhancement when the music is reverent and uplifting, where it seems to be something grander than yourself. And, um, you know, we, if we, when we do have a piano here, I didn't talk to a musician ahead of time, uh, we often give some demonstrations uh, in regards to this. But the, uh, a type of music that has been shown to be very enhancing, in fact, it's done a lot of the uh, mental health things, is a music, if you've ever, how many of you have been to California in this room? Okay, about over half of you have been to California. That's pretty incredible. Um, if you've ever, if you, most people have gone to California, they go to Southern California. And if you go to Southern California, I would encourage you to take time to visit Forest Lawn Glendale. In Forest Lawn Glendale, you will see a stained glass reproduction of the Last Supper painting of Leonardo da Vinci. It's a great painting. It's description of all that, but you'll also see the largest painting on the crucifixion of Christ in all of the world. And it's a painting that will, uh, it's not what you anticipate it's going to be about. If I, if I thought you weren't ever going to go to California, I might tell you more about it, but I don't want to uh, not ruin it. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a curtain there, you get in, it's bigger than a football field, this painting. And uh, you sit down in the chair, and before the show begins, and they will actually open it up, and then they'll have spotlights on the different characters. So it's a, it's a big um, scene. But before the show begins, they do something very frontal lobe and handsome. They play Handel's Margo. And it's very touching as you're, as you're preparing that mood. And so your frontal lobe is tuned up uh, by the time uh, this starts. It's actually been shown to be very beneficial to go through uh, an exercise like that. And the, and the music is very reverent and uplifting and not overpowering. It's beautiful melodies and harmonies. So take care of our frontal lobe. Protect it from mechanical injury. This is why you need to wear your seatbelts, why you need to wear your helmets if you're participating in sports where there's a high likelihood that you might bang your head. And by the way, this is one of my pet peeves against the popular worldwide sport called soccer. There's two things I have against soccer. Number one, you are prohibited from utilizing your hands in three dimensions. You know, it's not a frontal look enhancing sport, per se. Um, you know, unless you're the goalie. And the goalie's not repetitively using his hands. It's, you know, it's maybe eight times during an hour and a half. So, you know, it's not, uh, not that big a thing. So that's one of the pet peeves I have against it. I, it is an aerobic sport. I will give you that. It can, it, it's for fitness and those types of things. But the other issue I have with it is this rule, since you can't use your hands, that ball is coming with you, and it's a pretty heavy ball, and what do you use instead? Yeah. Your head. The studies have actually shown, well documented, that there is injury that occurs to the brain in subtle ways, and inflammation. And you know, the front part of your brain is where you have more sharp, skull structures. And you know, the consistency of your brain is soft. It's actually a very soft organ in this hard shell. And so as you're banging it, you're actually producing some inflammatory response that can actually have an effect uh, over time. So I would encourage you, if you love soccer for aerobic reasons, go ahead and play it. Get aerobic. 
but you know, use your chest or find a way to be a you know an athlete and you know go upside down and kick it with your feet. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm thinking it might be a little more accurate that way. Anyways, you know, you can see these back flips and have someone uh, booted with their feet, and it would be a whole lot better than the head probably if you get good at it. But uh, anyways, protect your brain. The point is, protect your brain from mechanical injuries. So fly it with good oxygen. How do you do that? Exercise, yeah, and deep breathing. You know, just the exercise of three deep breaths every once in a while can actually be helpful. Give it good nutrition. We talked a little bit about that. We could have given you a couple of hours just on nutrition in the brain. It's, it's exciting information, but we talked about the major things, being more plant-based, getting the omega-3, the folate, getting adequate sunlight is important, actually. Vitamin D is important for brain function. And just like a muscle, if you don't use it, you're going to what? Lose it. You're going to lose it. And so you need to exercise your brain with frontal lobe activities. What's a good frontal lobe activity to exercise your brain with? Reading what? Actually, reading the Bible is good because that the frontal lobe is where the spiritual part is, and not just reading, but analyzing it, uh, contemplating on it, um, control the inputs over what we're seeing and hearing. Let's stay away from these things that are quotes fun, but suppressing the frontal lobe. Let's have that zero tolerance policy we talked about earlier. Uh, that is something that will produce a significant benefit. Unfortunately, our brains can grow. Again, I've mentioned a uh, number of people. One was from Ardmore, Oklahoma, um, who had an IQ of 80. He was actually pushed through grade after grade. In America, in some public school systems, it's thought to um, not be good to keep, keep a person behind who's failing because it will ruin his self-esteem to be a bigger kid among all these smaller kids. And so they tend to move him along. And uh, he was this type of kid, but later on he, be, he went to this restaurant. He became a plant-based vegetarian, uh, which helped him some. Then he started studying the Bible, and that helped him, but he went to a Bible school that I know of called Mission College. And I was asking the director there how he was doing because I knew he was a low IQ. A nice guy, but a low IQ guy. And um, he said, you know, he's having a tough time. I'm not sure if he's going to pass because, you know, it was an accredited school. Uh, but uh, he ended up passing and he wasn't at the bottom of the class, so he got his grades up. And a, a few, about a year later, he's coming to me to the uh, eating at the restaurant there in Ardmore. And he said, you know, I love doing Bible worker work, Dr. Nedley, but I'd really like to become a doctor. I must admit, even though I'm into optimizing my brain, one of the first words out of my mouth were this, being a doctor is not for everybody. <laughs> and he says, well, I realize that, but he said, you know, I'd really like to be able, I know I had a hard time through Bible worker school, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes to optimize. Can you help me with that? And so I spent some time with him going over all this stuff. And he had high EQ, he had motivation. So he put this all into practice. And in one year, his IQ went from 80 to 120. Wow. And he enrolled in pre-med classes. And since he wasn't used to pre-med, I remember the first semester he got a B minus pre-med subject, and then the next semester he got it up to an A minus, and he started to improve. He took his MCAT, and he's in medical school today. In fact, he's going to graduate uh, in a year. Uh, and so it, uh, these things can make a tremendous difference. Our environment and what we are doing with our brain is far more important than who our parents were. A lot of times we think it's just the smartness of our parents in regards to how smart we are. That has some role to play, uh, but not near the role that environment and our own personal choices are making. The other thing we need to do is correct our distorted thoughts. We talked about that in the first hour this morning to some extent. Um, 
and I would encourage you, we uh, have a book called The Lost Art of Thinking that goes over the 10 different ways of distorted thinking today. We just talked about two of the ways. And then prevent or control disease that affects it. The study of Daniel has been shown to enhance the frontal lobe of the brain as well. And so I would encourage you, if you want to be more intelligent, more analytical, make better decisions, have a greater capacity to empathize with others, have better discernment, have greater ability to see into the future, have greater ability to overcome an addiction, or a greater power to follow your conscience, or to be more open to understanding and doing the will of God, review your life habits. See what there is in your life that can change. It might be as simply as your bedtime. It might be having that digital free time where you're going to go 12 hours a day without a digital device. By the way, I should mention something else in regards to circadian rhythms. Your circadian rhythms are adversely affected by using a digital device within three hours of going to bed. So the best time to use your digital device? In the morning, actually. Or and um, you know, throughout the day where you don't want to be distracted, it's best not to utilize it. But it does adversely affect sleep and some other things because of the blue light that's being emitted from these screens and those sorts of things. So I'll close with the words of Proverbs chapter 8. By the way, um, before I close, just a couple of quotes. I didn't bring them with me for this presentation. But by coming here today, you don't think necessarily this is true, but you walked into the largest room in Sam Uke University. And that is the room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> and we are told that the Lord has given our brains, Ellen White says, that the Lord has created our brains with the capacity for continual improvement and has given us all possible aid in the work through this counsel and advice and science. And she says, through the provisions of divine grace, if we implement God's best plan for our brain, we can attain almost to the excellence of angels. Even in the sinful world, our brains can be almost to the excellence of angels. And then she makes an, you know, an appeal to young people. She says, choose your habit. To be like Daniel's. And she says, God will reward you with four things if you do that. A clear brain, unimpaired judgment, keen perceptions. Let's see if I can remember the, the four of them. Uh, God will reward you with unimpaired judgment, keen brain, clear perceptions, and I'll have to look it up. Uh, I don't have it in, uh, in front of me after um, uh, two hours, but uh, I'll think of it. But it's along that same line. It's, a, it's an improvement in, the, um, in our brain ability. And, and then she goes on to say, the youth of today whose principles are firm and unwavering will be blessed with health of body, mind, and soul. It's not a myth and if. They will be blessed if their principles are firm and unwavering. So I encourage you, also recognize the value of wisdom. This person had more rubies than anyone else. Uh, Forbes magazine recently said he's the wealthiest man since Solomon. You have to go back to Solomon to have the wealthiest man on planet Earth. You think Warren Buffett was rich. He's nothing compared to Solomon. When you take a look at the amount of money he had compared to the global monetary supply. But Solomon said wisdom is better than what? And all the things that may be desired. Just think of your number one desire in life. Whatever that might be, Solomon says, you don't have it in perspective. Because whatever it is that you might be desired, it's not to be compared to what? To wisdom. And so, choose wisdom. Get on the course for optimizing your uh, questions? Yes? I wonder if you could, uh, I think you tell the audience what I have heard from you in terms of how the early sun affects uh, the brain as it comes to the higher certain angle. 
Well, um, yes, what about light therapy? We actually utilize, in our program, we actually distribute medical grade light boxes to everybody. In fact, they go home with them. Um, because in the winter time, you know, the sun isn't up at 6 a.m. It's actually better to have that same schedule as far as the light cycle is concerned. But you don't have to look directly at the sun. Uh, in fact, the best way of getting the light is where it's offset about 20 degrees because of the way the rods and the cones are in the red. And so you'll actually make more serotonin that way by being a little bit offset. And so you don't have to look directly at the light. It comes at you at an angle. You can be reading your books, you can be listening to music, you can be doing other things and still getting the benefit of that bright light. So I think that's what you're, you're talking about there. Any other questions? Yes? Best time for sunshine? Okay. Um, there's two best times for sunlight. One is early in the morning to set your body clock. The other is as far as making vitamin D is concerned. It's going to be enough to be able to get ultraviolet light to change your skin color a little bit darker. Uh, and uh, Korea, I have to look at it. I think Korea is too far north for you to be getting any vitamin D December or January. Um, you don't have enough direct sunlight to be able to. So even if you're out there all day and you're as white as can be, you're not going to get any tan uh, this time of year. And so vitamin D is fat soluble. You can store it if you're getting enough in the summertime. But uh, in the summertime, it would be between 10 and 3 would be the best times. And uh, say spring or fall, the best time would be between 11 and 1. So get some sun exposure. Expose some of that skin for vitamin D. And it's so important that everyone that comes to our program, we're measuring their vitamin D level and how much they have stored at the 25 hydroxy level. Korea is actually below Washington, D.C., and Seoul is below Washington, D.C. in latitude. Seoul is below Washington, D.C. in latitude. Okay, well, that's good to know. So uh, you might be able to get a little bit, uh, uh, a slight amount, December and January, but not much. Probably you'd be able to get it November and February, though, and be able to get some vitamin D. Uh, yes, question here. I noticed that the... Uh, the lecture's been recorded. Is there a website or a place where you can go to download these or to get the audio? Uh, or you know, I don't know. They're not uh, They're not going to be on our website that I know of. Um, does anyone want to mention um, how people can get these recordings afterwards? Actually, uh, there's a, on YouTube, there's a web uh, channel called Korean Media Missions. And so you can just find it on that. Korea what? I would encourage you to get it within a couple of weeks. Normally we don't um, have our stuff up um, there long term. Um, and uh, the reason being is that it depends on the audience that I'm speaking to as well um, because we uh, devise it differently. But um, we'll need to pull that down in about a month. So have it up there just for a month. Uh, that's it. I'm glad you mentioned that. And then there was a question over here, and then one there in the center. Uh, do you have experience reading Alzheimer's patients? Uh, the public question. Yes, what about Alzheimer's? Uh, in regards to Alzheimer's, it's good to catch them early. Uh, if they're caught too late, we haven't found anything to be able to reverse that significantly. And um, But if they're caught early, there's four major things that we have found to really help stabilize them. We've had patients that have now gone 20 years on this regimen and, and not had significant advancement in their disease. Number one is to tightly control their blood pressure less than 115 over 80. The higher your blood pressure, the worse your brain gets over time. Number two, to control the cholesterol. The higher your cholesterol, the worse your brain gets over time. So we'd like to get their cholesterol down to 140. Number three, um, utilize um, the omega-3 molecules, particularly the non-fish DHA. Non-fish DHA has been the only type of DHA that's been 
been shown to help reverse it as well as stabilize um, age-related cognitive decline. And it can also help with Alzheimer's, as we kind of mentioned um, in our omega-3 portion of things. And how much do you need of that? Uh, the studies have shown 900 milligrams a day makes a significant benefit. So we would get this, and if you look on our website, we'll, we'll show you the non-fish DHA um, supplements. There's one called Opti-3 and even a better one called New IQ. It can even help you when you're in school in regards to focus and concentration. And then the third supplement, or the second supplement we utilize is an antioxidant called N-acetylcysteine. It's very cheap, but 2,400 milligrams a day, about four capsules of that. And that'll work better than any medicine or anything like that. And if you do those four things, and also try to get rid of the arachidonic acid and some of the other things in the diet, um, you can produce some stabilization um, of the disease. Now, uh, the food you mentioned, uh, it depends on whether the question is, will the food have the same effects as the non-fish DHA? It will if you are totally plant-based. If you're on arachidonic acid, you don't convert over the DHA very readily. So that's another disadvantage of the arachidonic acid. And we, I, one more, that's what we're told. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Well, Loma Linda has fallen into the trap that some others have fallen into, and that is this fascination with things that have benefits and risks. Uh, you know, the, the world is fascinated by even red wine because it has some potent antioxidants. But we talked about some of the risks of wine today as well. And, you know, uh, caffeine has, you know, some benefits and risks as well. You know, coffee, those type of things. Uh, they'll talk about coffee, uh, you know, the cocoa bean has some antioxidants, you know. But what my idea is, let's get the antioxidants from other beans that don't have the risks associated with them. And we'll be able to do just as well. It is true that cocoa has some significant antioxidants. And so, but the problem is when you're eating chocolate, I don't know of anybody that eats straight cocoa. You know? You try straight cocoa, it's not all that appetizing. Uh, but in order to make cocoa appetizing, what do you have to do to it? You have to put in a lot of sugar, and you also have to put in some saturated fat of some sort. And those two things have some risks. Now, what they didn't tell you is if you contrast that um, with getting a highly antioxidant food, um, you know, you would have been able to do better than that. Uh, and that's what other studies are indicating. And so, um, uh, yes, cocoa has some benefits, um, but here's the other thing. I, I should mention, even in regards to it gets me off on some of the low ended studies. By the way, I talked to one of the researchers. I ran into him about two weeks ago. And, you know, I think they're doing the best they can uh, in some respects, but they're also not necessarily looking at the whole perspective. This whole thing, for instance, they also said pesco vegetarians have less colon cancer than, than plant-based vegetarians. You might have heard about that. Uh, and in reality, what they didn't look at is the uh, going back in time long enough. For instance, a lot of the benefits that have shown on alcohol, when someone claims that they are a non-alcohol drinker and dies, they get lumped under the noun, the person that was not drinking alcohol, but many of those people that die that are not drinking were heavy drinkers up until they had a serious disease and quit drinking. And so they get lumped as a death that is a non-alcohol death, but in reality, it's been very poor um, uh, studies. And so what one study did to try to erase all of that, they found out there was no group of, of light or moderate drinkers that was healthier than those that had been lifelong abstainers. 
The only difference was a woman who started doing one drink every few days at age 65 had the same death risk as those who had never drank. So when you look at that statistic, we should raise the drinking age to 65 and we should only have females be able to drink it on a moderate basis because they're equivalent. And with the pesco vegetarian issue, it takes 30 years. You know, I'm in GI, it takes 30 years before you have a cancer cell form before you actually get colon cancer. And so what you needed to look at was 30 years earlier, and we weren't necessarily looking at that. And so those are things, when you're just doing observational studies, which many of these Adventist health studies are based on, are observational studies, you have to have some of those other things in the perspective. Okay. One more question. Uh, would you tell us about vitamin B12? In uh, they say uh, vegetarian lacks uh, vitamin B12. Okay, what about B12? B12 is important. Yeah. It's also important for methylation as well. And it's so important we measure everyone's B12 level when they come into our program as well. And we want to make sure they're getting adequate B12. Adequate B12 does not come from plants, it does not come from animals, it comes from healthy bacteria. Uh, and uh, that's the uh, that's the source. And if you're not sure what your B12 level is, it doesn't hurt to take a B12 supplement. They're very cheap and they're very effective, and we can uh, chew on them uh, as well. Oh, I was going to tell you about there it is. God will reward you with four things: a calm nerve, clear brain, unimpaired judgment, keen perception. So those were the four things. If you have habits that compares with Daniel's, uh, and that is uh, Adventist Home, page 301. Well, it's been very pleasurable to be with you uh, here in Seoul the last few days, and I certainly wish you all the best of health of body, mind, and soul. Thank you.